Hi everyone. Thanks, Rob, and thanks, Kunal, Kin, for having me here. Well, I want to talk to you about my life, my art, and India, my country. Before that, could we move to my slides, please? You know, when I asked my three-year-old daughter why she's being ridiculously naughty, she looks at me like I'm totally mad. And she says, I don't know, just because. And that's when it occurred to me that as we grow up, we, we develop this really peculiar faculty of our brain that's constantly telling us stories to make sense of the world around us. And these stories become the core of our identity. And when we share these stories with each other, they become knowledge. I think we are all storytellers. Artists are storytellers, paleontologists, business people, scientists, doctors, all of us are storytellers. Now, there are two ways in which we share the story with the world. Oh, that was my painting, by the way. Um, there are two ways in which we share story with the world. The old form of knowledge, uh, the way we share knowledge, the old form is knowledge deployed by an individual, an expert. Knowledge deployed by a university, a school, the authority. And recently, we've seen the emergence of a new form of knowledge, knowledge deployed by the crowd. Now, personally, like Wikipedia, for example, personally, I have an issue with both these forms of knowledge. I quit formal education when I was in high school, and then since then, I've never had a job or never studied. I learn from the world as my classroom. And I want to tell you that knowledge deployed by the expert is full of bias and personal stake. Whether it's education for good citizenship, for innovation, or industrial revolution, it's bloody biased. Now, knowledge deployed by the crowd has its own problems. Imagine one truth emerging from a crowd that has survived edit wars. I think it becomes sterile and disinterested. I think we are finally primed today to see the emergence of a third form of knowledge, one in which multiple perspectives coexist, multiple truths coexist, to give a richer understanding of who we are. Now, if I ask you, who are you, I don't need your vital statistics. I, I, I want to ask, depending on whether I want to hire you, marry you, date you, f I mean, whatever I want to do. With. <laughs> ouch, ouch. No, you, I was not going there. Um, depending on that, I will ask your mother, your friend, your lover, your, uh, your employer, your employee. So I want to say truth is perspectives. And I want to welcome you guys to what I believe is a fragmented age. Now, I come from a very peculiar country, and I think Sam and Karna both talked about this. I was very happy. I come from a very small country of 1.3 billion people. Um, <laughs> India, of course. And what we know about India is the corruption. We know there's lots of corruption. We know there's development. We know all the things that we know. But I want to share with you two things that I find very exciting that is rarely spoken about. The first thing is that India is the world's most impossible democracy. There is nothing that makes two Indians Indian. Not language, not religion, not food, not a culture. And look at our rupee note. We have 15 languages in which it says one rupee. Now, I think this is a very special thing. That's the first thing I want you to know. We are impossible. Maybe cricket and Bollywood come close to being the, the things that bring us together. The second thing is, as Sam rightly said, I belong to a majority. 65% of my country is under 35. And my question in 2020, I'm beginning to realize that we're going to inherit a very cool country, the only experiment in the world of plurality. The only experiment, where I belong to the fragmented age. And suddenly, just suddenly, this plurality is beginning to make sense. We have a hundred year head start in dealing with the fragmented age. Now, this is underexplored. We talk about outsourcing. We talk about service economy. Screw that. We are the creative capital of the world. We have dealt with plurality. I want to say, when we talk about secularism in this country, we talk about the melting pot. 
Everyone comes here and becomes a melting pot. And unfortunately, the melting pot is applied in businesses, in governments, everywhere. You have, we all understand innovation. We all talk about innovation. We say innovation needs plurality, right? You need different perspectives. But what do we get at the end? We get the melting pot. In India, we have the thali. The thali is like a buffet. We don't have a melting pot. Thank you. And this is the ethos that I want to bring to businesses. I'm an artist. What the hell am I telling you about business? I'll come to that. But I think we need the thali. And the reason why we need the thali is because multiple inputs should result in multiple outputs. We kill the standard. I don't believe in the standard. I think we need multiple solutions coming out of multiple, a plurality of inputs. And that is the third form of knowledge that's emerging. Oops. I want to show you how I, I deal with that in my art and how as an Indian artist, I'm trying to retell the story of India's independence through multiple perspectives. I think within every thinking Indian lies a Gandhian, a Marxist, and a Maoist, and a Cartoon Network character fighting for supremacy. <laughs> so that's my take on Indian history. But I really wanted to push the idea of perspectives. So when I had my first baby, I made a children's book, a rather unusual children's book for Indians. I want to share that with you. Can we raise the volume? Indian trying to get one of these American books and pop shows, forget it. It's not the way I was brought up. So I said, I'm going to counter this with my own propaganda. You know, carefully, it's a homosexual couple bringing up a child. You don't like it? Shake it. And you have a lesbian couple. <laughs> Shake it. And you have a heterosexual couple. You know, I don't even believe in the concept of an ideal family. I have another idea. It's a children's book about Indian independence, very patriotic. But when you shake it, we get Pakistan's perspective. Shake it again, and you get the British perspective. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I believe that perspectives are the most important things to understand creativity. And only when you're creative can you imagine yourself in the shoes of someone different from you Thank you, Karna. You mentioned, you know where you are, but you mentioned empathy. I think creativity is the key to empathy. And perspectives are the key to empathy. And in a country like India, we have a mosque, a temple, and a gurudwara and whatnot sharing the same compound. We understand empathy. So, my book that I made with the shaking things did really well. I was really excited. I'd never read too many books in my life, but I won a very prestigious award, the Kirkus book. And what was special is I didn't use a single word in my book. It was all about pictures. Um, it, it created a bit of a revolution. I traveled around the world. I, I got all this attention. I was really excited. But then I was really sad inside me because the book I set out to do on Indian independence never materialized. The reason for this is no historian was willing to lend his name to this project. Firstly, because, for example, in Pakistan, there were multiple historians with different perspectives fighting for their own right perspective. Not only that, these guys change their minds all the time. Every time they have new evidence, they change their mind. <laughs> so what I realized was that perspectives are dynamic, and my art did not have dynamism. You had India's perspective, you have Pakistan's. So in order to make my art more dynamic, I could not do that within the silos of my painting world. I had to reach out to science. I want to show you my latest art project. You can see I'm wearing this headset. It's an EEG headset. I'm going to use this. It's reading my brain waves, and it's telling my computer what my mental state is. So, if I'm sad, it gets sad. If I'm happy, it tells my computer I'm happy. And using certain noise-canceling algorithms and behavioral algorithms, I've been able to change my artwork using this. I want to introduce you to Mona Lisa 2.0. She's grown up a little. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run up here. 
and I'm projecting my mental state onto Mona Lisa. It's actually reading my brain waves. I'm going to try and make a smile for you guys. And imagine, in a business school, an artist trying to calm down. I'm going to try and calm down in front of you guys. What the hell, I'm going to give it a shot. Any luck? Ah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is ha what happens when you bear yourself naked in front of her. <laughs> Could you switch back for me? Oops, I need to shut the sound off. I want to quickly show you some of the other projects I'm working on in collaboration with Sean from New View. This is a work I made for people who both love Gandhi and hate Gandhi. Use your brainwaves to keep him smiling, and you'll see everyone's getting along really well. But you stress him out, and he'll be the cause for communal violence, among the cartoons at least. <laughs> this, especially for my American friends. I have a getaway car there. <laughs> OK. It starts off as red. But you use your brainwaves to discover that there's an entire spectrum between red and blue. It's called learning flexibility, America. You know. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> Thank you. All, all the non Americans are just clapping. Uh -huh. <laughs> Rob, I don't get it. <laughs> this, meet Venus 2.0. She's really fashionable, v Birth of Venus, because she just got off a visit from the Indian Censorship Bureau. You don't like censorship? That's okay. Use my brain waves, think naughty thoughts, and you can start undressing her, uncensoring her. <laughs> and when you totally uncensor her, you can set her free. Speaking of censorship, the one thing you cannot censor are your brain waves. You may be able to censor your words, but not your thoughts. So imagine when you walk into my next show, you're going to bring my artwork to life without even being able to control it. So I think the role of my spectator has changed from someone who's just looking at my work to someone who's actively engaged, changing the politics and the biases of my work. Now, recently, I was fortunate enough to address a medical gathering, a hardcore medical gathering. And what I was saying is, can you change the role of the patients in healthcare? Can you change the role of your consumers? Can they be more active? Can you have multiple outcomes? Can you apply this to governments? Can you apply this thinking, the Thali thinking, to everything? And that's my dream as an artist, not to sit here and illustrate your beautiful journals, but to really engage with you in epistemology, in the application of your thinking. Um, oops. I want to leave you with three, three thoughts, uh, just as a recap. Um, the first thing I want to leave with you is that India is the world's most impossible democracy. Remember that. And if you really want to believe in innovation, do it the Thali style, not the melting pot style. Because when you do it with the Thali ethos, you have multiple outcomes and, and you engage your audience. The second thing I want to leave with you is that empathy and creativity are very closely connected. So if you want to talk about innovation, whether you're designing an infrastructure for, you know, the fact that you even say you're designing an infrastructure implies there's a creative process. It implies you need an artist. An artist can think metaphorically and emotionally. We bring metaphor and emotion into to reasoning. And, and I always say there's a difference. The reason why I quit formal education and I educated myself is because I think there's a difference between education and learning. Education is what a system does to you. Learning is what you do for yourself. Education is supposed to lead to learning. Unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. So I am a part of an extremely experimental uh, school out of MIT in Boston, um, where we, we debunk the, the regular myths of education. I also believe the final thought I want to leave you with is that we belong to this fragmented age. And in this fragmented age, 
future is for the person who can creatively and actively engage with the world and adapt to change. We don't know what the future holds. The only thing we know is it's changing rapidly. So if you want to adapt to change and make sense of fragments and stitch your own fabric out of fragments, call the artist. Don't sit in your own silos of your own economic world and try to make sense. I'm reaching out to you. I'm here in a management school. I have to thank Rob for allowing me to be a part of this conversation because I'm an artist and I want to participate with you guys, with scientists, with governments, and, and, and bring in my way of thinking and problem solving. That's all, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.